In your visual landscape with animals, you see them for months, years, and plants, so you have a familiarity factor. But mushrooms that come up and disappear in four or five days, some of them can feed you, some can kill you, some can heal you, some can send you on a spiritual journey. So to have something so powerful and yet so ephemeral, uh, it's natural for humans to avoid that which they don't understand out of fear because they don't know the difference. But you know, 23 primates consume mushrooms, humans being one of them. And so that speaks to a long ancestral use of mushrooms going back, you know, in our primate evolutionary tree for a very, very long time. We separated from fungi 650 million years ago. Maybe you did, dude. I know some people that are probably still... <laughs> well, basically, <laughs> we, we, we are des descendants uh, of fungi. Yeah. Um, we share more common ancestry with fungi than we do with any other kingdom. And fungi are closer to animals than they are to plants. Animals came from fungi. You and I are actually fungal bodies. I'm speaking to basically another fungal body right now. Okay. Uh, and from a cellular point of view, under the microscope, human cells, animal cells, and fungal cells are very, very similar. We exhale carbon dioxide and we inhale oxygen. And it's really interesting that the, the, many of the bacterial diseases that infect fungi also infect us. Our best antibiotics against bacteria come from fungi, penicillin being the obvious example. But, you know, the universe was created about 13.8 billion years ago from the Big Bang. The Earth coalesced out of stardust about 4.5 billion. The, er the earliest records of life we have is about 3.8 billion years ago, a single uh, cell uh, single cell organisms, but just recently in lava beds in South Africa, they found mycelium infused through the lava 2.4 billion years ago. Now we split from uh, fungi 650 million years ago, and then in Brazil this past year, they found a fully intact, uh, apparently a fossilized mushroom published in Nature, it's a very, very reputable scientific journal, and that one is 1.4 billion years old. So the oldest multicellular organism in the fossil record today is this fungus and lava in South Africa, 2.4 billion years ago. A fully formed mushroom who had this form uh, grew, uh, was growing for 1.4 billion years ago. We were, we separated from fungi 650 million years ago. Mushrooms have had their form longer than we've had our form by more than a billion years. So but think of that, mushrooms had their form before we had ours. Yeah. These are elders. These are, these are ancient organisms. These are the, really the, the overlord underlords of our ecosystem. And I suspect, and as these neural networks, they have more neural connections in the mycelial mass, they're, they're over a thousand acres, and we have our brain. They are actually accumulating not only genetic intelligence, but I think that as time goes on, I hope that we will be able to interface with them. Because I think that there is, a, there is many benefits of us communicating with mycelium that can give us um, rapid responses to catastrophia. That's how they've evolved. And we're now the biggest walking catastrophe that I know walking across the planet. And we need to engage these fungal allies for the benefits that we need to put into play in order to prevent uh, the loss of biodiversity. But the hypothesis of the stone ape, uh, 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 of the stone ape which I think you've alluded to before, is that with climate change and as the savannas increased and our primate ancestors came out of the, out of the forest canopies, they're, they're tracking across the savanna. If you're a hunter, what do you look? You look for footsteps and you look for scat. Uh, and the most significant fleshy mushroom of all, not a poop in, in Africa, hippopotamus, elephant, you know, uh, deer, antelope, etc. 
um, is Las Bicavensis. It's a very large mushroom. You're hungry, you're with your clan, you consume it, and then 20 minutes later, you're, you are catapulted in this extraordinary experience. Psilocybin substitutes as serotonin, becomes a better neurotransmitter, activates neurogenesis, it causes new neurons to form, new pathways of knowledge. So that's the stone date hypothesis, and it speaks to a mystery that the human brain, uh, basically the brain cavity doubled in size in about two million years. Even though we may not be able to prove it, I ask people to suspend their disbelief for a second. Now think of this. Our primate ancestors are going across the savanna, they ingest these mushrooms as a clam. Massive input for anyone that's eating these mushrooms. Huge amounts of data is coming in. Fractal patterns, geometrical you know, landscapes occur. Uh, you have empathy. Uh, you have greater courage. You're fighting a saber-toothed saber, saber tiger. You know, one day you're, you have a fear of it. Uh, we know now from neurogenesis and the extinction of the fear response that has been clinically proven, psilocybin allows you to reset and have different neurological pathways to respond to fear, overcoming the fear of conditioned response, potentially PTSD. So, but this wouldn't happen one time with one hominid group. It wouldn't happen two times, ten times. It happened millions and millions and millions and millions of times over millions and millions of years. This leads to what I think is called, uh, this should be called epigenetic neurogenesis. We know that there's a regeneration of neurons. We know that cell substitutes the serotonin. It opens the floodgates of the senses. You have a lot more data coming in. And we know that it has the extinction of the, of the fear response. So if you're the leader of your clan, you've had this traumatic uh, event, either a war or cataclysm, from earthquakes, whatever the case may be, or encounter a saber tooth tiger, whatever. If you're the leader of that clan and you can overcome your fear response, you have courage and you have empathy. Those are leadership skills. I think people should take note of it. People like to follow leaders who are courageous and yet kind, who they can trust, they'll have their best interests in mind. So I think this propelled, I think it's a lot, it's a very good explanation. It's an unprovable hypothesis. But now we're at a junction and, for the ne and we're ready for the next quantum leap in human consciousness.
as a person. Because every person is conditioned. Every person belongs to some party, some religion, some philosophical group, some political group, some kind of uh, social group, some identity you are wearing. And every identity fights to retain its own perspective. Okay? We are never, ever, ever going to agree. While you are in the state of personhood, this is what is radical. I'm going to bring you the message of Ramana Maharshi. I'm going to bring it.
what are called primary decomposers, fungi, right? It means they only live off dead matter. Now, vegetarianism is held up as a spiritual ideal, but compared to the strategy of mushrooms, vegetarianism is an orgy of mass death on an appalling scale. Uh, so if perhaps the mushroom is essentially Buddhist in its approach, notice how, how non-invasive of the world of matter the mushroom is. It forms a diaphanous network through the soil as tenuous as cobwebs and yet filled with neurotransmitters. And you may remember from last year, it was discovered that the largest organisms on this planet are mushroom mycelial mass. They're, they cover acres, they weigh more than blue whales, and they're so old, it's better not even to speak of it. Uh, this looks to me like this is what intelligence driven by ethical concern for life would design itself into.
use of uh, things that would lift us out of the egocentric situation could therefore be med considered medical as healing for a social disorder. But again, I would say that they used in that way should be used as medicine in the sense that they don't become diet. Because in my experience, and of course in this matter, everybody speaks for themselves. But say I consider just myself alone, uh, I wouldn't feel very uh, put out if, say, LSD were to vanish from the earth tomorrow. Because I have discovered that this is not the sort of thing you sort of take every so often, like you go to church, or if you do, uh, but it's something that you can take uh, several times in a gradually diminishing quantity, and then you've had it. Beyond that, it's up to you to integrate your vision with uh, everyday life and with all various kinds of knowledge. Uh, that's uh, enough is enough. But there are other people who seem to think that uh, the great thing to do is to start out with a little and then keep on going, making it bigger and bigger and bigger, uh, as if they were looking for something uh, that should lie at the end of the line. And then it becomes a diet. really has something to say to the priest because priests tend by and large to want to hook you uh, in other words to keep you coming to church so that you will pay your dues and uh, the church will prosper so the more people they can get hooked on religion the merrier now priests in this way ought to learn from the doctors and try and get rid of people by uh, telling them their gospel or whatever it is they have to say and say now you've had it go away <laughs> because you see if you do that uh, you will create a vacuum and it will always be filled just as when the doctor the faster a doctor can get people out of his office they go around and tell everybody this man cured me I didn't have to go back to him so more people will be coming in there are always plenty and plenty of people never come to an end so in a way the religious man uh, ought to handle a huge turnover of people coming through and going away, coming through and going away, then he's really working. But he should not get them hooked on the medicine. Indeed, there is a famous Latin phrase, crux medicina mundi, the cross, the medicine of the world. This is a lonely journey Cause I can't carry on right now with Christ nevertheless I live so also when it comes to the use of any technique whatsoever whether it's yoga or LSD or what have you for the spiritual awakening there applies to it the Buddha's symbol of the raft the Buddha likened his method his Dharma or doctrine or method to a raft. It's also called a yana, or vehicle, hence the Mahayana, the big vehicle, the Hinayana, the little vehicle. And it takes you across the river of which this shore is birth and death, and the other shore liberation, nirvana. Now you get on that raft and you go over, and when you get to the other shore, you leave the raft behind. Same way they say in Zen Buddhism, 
Now their technique, the use of the koan or meditation problem, is like knocking at a door with a brick. When the door is opened, you don't carry the brick inside. You leave the brick behind. So with all these things, they are means, upaya, and they have as their objective deliverance from means. The Christian mystics speak of the highest state of contemplative prayer or union with God as a union without means. And I would extend the, the sense of the word means even to ecstasy. In other words, ecstasy is invariably in the great religious traditions not a final state. Ecstasy is an intermediate state. Uh, so, for example, in, in Zen, when the experience of Satori or awakening comes about, there is an ecstasy. You feel marvelous. You feel as if you were walking on air. You feel absolutely unobstructed. You feel as happy as a lark. You feel, you know, this fantastic bang. It's marvelous. But that in itself is only incidental. A Zen saying says that monk who has a satori goes to hell as straight as an arrow. In other words, to have it is to cling to it. And if you think that the ecstasy is the important thing, it isn't. The, the ecstasy is an intermediate stage to bring you back to the point where you can see that everyday life, that your ordinary mind, as they say in Zen, is the Buddha mind. That everyday life as it is, is the great thing. And there is no difference between that and the divine life. Show you. Too. 